Sorry, I was making my Gruffalo cupcake. <laughs> okay. Uh, today we're reading from John 20, verses 19 to 29. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for, for the fear of the Jew, Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, was one of the 12, uh, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now where's Phil? He always gets me that. Oh, <laughs> How dare he go on holidays? Um, thank you, Owen. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Haley, for reading the passage. Really appreciate it. Um, can I ask, with a show of hands, how many of you have taught this passage before, either in a Bible study group, or maybe you've preached on it, or maybe just for your own private devotional times? How many of you have done that before? Can you see a couple? Yep. Um, when you heard it read today, how many of you thought, yep, I know what she's going to say? No. Oh, no, of course not. You know what? Um, I'm a little bit the same. Um, every time I hear a Bible reading, um, I also think, oh, I know what he or she is going to say. Um, I think this is the challenge that comes with uh, familiarity. Whenever things get too familiar, as humans, we tend to overlook its value and tune out. Uh, physically, we are present. But emotionally and spiritually, well, we're somewhere else. We might be thinking about what I've got to buy to make dinner today. Or we might be thinking about that thing that we've got to do for work. Or maybe, oh, I've got to call my sister to talk about uh, school holidays. Um, as the saying goes, familiarity breeds contempt. It's a well-known expression, I think, that warns us to not take things for granted, to not take people for granted. Instead, for us to commit to maintaining a sense of appreciation, curiosity, and respect. And that's what I hope for today, that as we look at this very familiar passage that all of us here have interacted with over the years of our Christian journey, that we will remain appreciative of Thomas's story, that we will remain curious, that we will respect it. So with that, let's dive in. As I prepared for this message, I started to wonder if this passage and the other accounts in which we see Jesus showing up to his disciples after the resurrection are stories of grief rather than just stories of faith, which is how we usually tend to interpret this passage. After all, Jesus did say, because you have seen me, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We place so much focus on those words that we tend to conclude that Thomas' account and all the other testimonies after are just about faith. 
we take the declaration of Jesus to then mean that we are not to be like Thomas, that we are not to be like Peter, that we are not to be like Judas, that we are not to be like the men who were walking to, um, to Emmaus. We're not to be like them. We are named to just believe. N.T. Wright, who, by, who is a famous Christian scholar and who has spent more time than I have in understanding the New Testament, explains the first Christians, by contrast to their disciples, had to believe without seeing to trust in the story of Jesus and his resurrection, even though they had not been there. I read that and I'm like, yep, amen. The most difficult thing about our faith is to trust in the resurrection of Jesus without physical proof. So I take so much comfort in the words of Jesus when he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Because I believe, though I have no physical proof for it. However, is that it? Is all of these testimonies just about giving us insights into how the early Christian community grappled with the issues of faith and believe in Jesus in the absence of physical proof. I'm not convinced that our testimonies, our journey with God are just linear. I believe that our journey with God looks more like this. And depending where we're sitting, each of us will have, will look at it through a different lens. And we can gain so much of what God is saying to us by listening to each other and listening to what God is revealing to each other about one testimony through the many different lenses that are here today. So this is my lens that I'm presenting to you. I started to wonder if there was more to this story, to this testimony. So I did some reading and I came across uh, the Christian calendar, which some denominations use to guide their sermons and festivities throughout the year. We Protestants are not very keen on using the Christian calendar, I say opposed to our Catholic brothers and sisters. Um, and I think we're missing something out of that, if I'm honest with you. Because what I found out is that today, which is the first Sunday after Easter Sunday is usually referred to as Low Sunday. Why Low Sunday, I wondered. I'm sure you are too. Well, Low Sunday means different things, but one of the things is that apparently attendance on a Low Sunday is usually lower. <laughs> wow. Because everybody comes on Easter Sunday, we get a lot of visitors, you know, people are like, oh, maybe I should go to church, and they come, and it's great, and it's joyful. But the following Sunday, well, numbers drop. So that's one of the reasons it's referred to as Low Sunday. Another reason is to describe the mood of the service. Compared to Easter Sunday, which is filled with joyful music, which is filled with creativity, which is filled with enthusiasm, and yes, we're victorious, amen. Low Sunday, it's just a little bit lower. Uh, we're grappling with the, with the, with the grief of the disciples. We are trying to kind of connect with their confusion. Hold on, he, he died, now you're telling me he's alive? Like, what, what's going on? I saw him die on that cross. I know what I saw. Don't come and tell me now that he's alive. So this got me more curious. Is it possible that Thomas' account has another layer to it? Is it possible that Thomas' account is also about the grief he was going through as he lost his friend, and the future that he had envisioned for his community. The more I started to wonder, the more I googled, which, once, which is research really, it's not just googling. Um, but, and what I found is, is that yes, there are many theologians and scholars who have spent more time than I have actually discovering that this testimony is not just about faith but it's also about grief. It's about trauma. It's about a bunch of people who had seen someone die in a traumatic way and having to deal with the grief of losing their friend and everything that they had placed on that friendship and everything that they had placed on Jesus' power that they had witnessed. 
in one of the scholars, I, I can't remember who it was now, I, I forgot to write it down, but one of the things that this person said was that Thomas' initial, initial doubt comes from the profound grief he experienced after witness, witnessing Jesus' crucifixion. His demand to see and touch Jesus' wounds might reflect a deep emotion, emotional need for tangible proof to overcome his grief and accept the reality of Jesus' resurrection. Can we relate to that profound grief? What about our wider community? Can they relate to that overwhelming grief? I have a friend and I've got permission to share her testimony with you today. Um, she didn't grow up in the best home. Uh, it was a combination of domestic violence and emotional turmoil. And for a long time, she believed that she was unworthy of ever experiencing love. So while her friends were out there, you know, living life, um, she dedica dedicated herself to youth group, not just to serve, but to hide, hide from rejection. Over the years of teaching that with Jesus everything is possible and that following Jesus meant that you are protected and shielded, terms that I think we sometimes need to be careful how we use them. That's just a little random thought there. You might want to think about it. Um, she came to the conclusion that marrying a Christian man will protect her from the pain and of rejection that she had experienced in her earlier life. And then she became absolutely determined to make her home a place where no pain like that will ever be experienced by any member of her household. So over time, she met a lovely Christian guy who also came from a broken home. And they dated for a little while, but unfortunately things didn't quite work out. They tried, but it just didn't work out. She was devastated, gutted actually. It, felt her, it made her feel very rejected. So she went counseling for a period of time to deal with her breakup. And during that time, she got to know Jesus more. And she formed a beautiful community of people. And she felt supported and loved. And healing came into her life. And suddenly she was like feeling like herself again. And a good thing too, because she eventually will meet her husband. And they will get married. And life would be good until it wasn't. Until life happened again. Some of the pillars that had given her strength and purpose and value started to fall. And right now, she's in a place where she's grieving again. She again doesn't feel like she's worthy of love. And it's really hard for her to know what is real and what isn't. Usually in situations like this, just so you know, I'm a fixer-upper. So I research and I'm like, right. How can I fix this problem for my friend? Because it's my job, obviously, because I'm the Holy Spirit. Um, so how can I stop her doubting her worth and value? How can I remind her that she is loved? I did some research. This is what I found. Apparently, when someone experiences loss, whether it's death of a loved one or the end of a relationship or another significant life change like perimenopause, just throwing that out there, um, because we need to talk about this seriously, women over 50, you need to start sharing your testimonies. Okay. Um, when someone experiences that sort of loss and change, um, doubt can arise in various forms. Doubt in beliefs, we stop believing um, maybe in God or in a higher being, whatever it is that you believe, whatever fits that spiritual need. You start to doubt yourself, your abilities to cope, your resilience, your worthiness. You start to doubt others. Hmm. Grieving apparently individuals may experience doubt about the support and understanding of others, wondering if they are truly cared for and if others comprehend the depth of their pain. I found that very interesting. And then we start to have doubt in the future. Grief can suddenly feel so real that it robs, uh, robs us from the idea that there is hope, that there is joy, 
that God can make beautiful things out of the dust. When I started this, um, when I shared these findings with my friend, she agreed with it, and she has experienced loss in many ways over the last few years, and the doubts in her mind are so real, she is actually doubting everything. I wonder if this is how Thomas felt, how Peter felt, how the two disciples on their way to Emmaus felt, and even how Judas felt. They had just lost their friend and the future they had hoped to have with him, and they were grieving, and that grief manifested itself in different ways, and for Thomas, it was doubt. So what can we do in this situation? How can we help? What did Jesus do? Kindness. That's what he did. He showed kindness over and over and over again. Showing up to Thomas that way, letting Thomas touch him, that was an act of kindness. That was not an act of rebuke. Jesus was not giving him a lecture about the lack of faith he had. He was showing him kindness. Showing up to Peter and having breakfast with him by the beach, that was an act of kindness. Showing up to those two men on the way to Emmaus and having a chat and letting them know that he was there, that actually what they, who they were grieving was him and he was alive, that was kindness. According to a site that I landed on uh, regarding dealing with trauma, kindness plays a very crucial role in restoring hope during the grieving process. Kindness validates the grieving person, what the person is going through. It acknowledges their doubt. Empathy is another thing that kindness brings. It allows us to listen and understand and create a safe place for that person to say what they're feeling without judgment and without the need to fix them. I need to remember that. Support. Acts of kindness, such as offering practical help, a cup of tea, coffee, whatever it is, a meal, that alleviates the feeling of isolation and loneliness. Kindness has the power to restore trust, to build connection, to show the grieving person that they are not alone in this journey. And lastly, kindness has the amazing power to restore hope. Hope in that person to know that there's more to come. Joyfulness is coming. Hope is coming. Beautiful things are going to be made out of dust. Kindness can help that. When I read that, I thought, wonderful, because God is all, God is love, as we know, and love is kind, right? But then I started to wonder, how long do we need to show that kindness for? I mean, there must be a time frame, right? Like, I mean, eventually people need to snap out of it, right? I came across a theologian, which I'm going to confess right now, I've never heard of him until last week. His name is John Swinton. Maybe some of you here who are a little bit more, you know, um, academic have heard of him. He's a theologian and professor of practical theology, and he's known for his work on spirituality and mental health. So I kind of like him. I might check him out a little bit more. And in an article that he wrote, um, this is what he says, Thomas's doubt reflects the human experience of grappling with trauma and loss, highlighting the importance of compassion and understanding in spiritual communities. Highlighting the importance of compassion and understanding in spiritual communities. When I read that, I thought faith communities have such an important role to play in the healing of trauma. We get the privilege of being part of that process with God and every individual that is going through loss. But we can't put a time frame to the process of healing. We can't put our own agenda. We can't determine how that healing will look like. It takes as long as it takes and what it will look like is between God and that individual. But together, in community, we can actually support those who are grieving and those who are doing the caring. Because it's hard for everyone involved.
The testimony of Thomas is one of doubt and grief. And the way that Jesus responds to it is by showing kindness to his immediate needs, not only help, uh, by showing kindness to his immediate needs, not only helped him have faith again, but it restored hope and joy to his life. Do we need to experience that sort of kindness today? Does our inner West community need to experience that sort of kindness? Does the world, and you just need to turn on the news to see what's going on, does the world need that sort of kindness today? We're going to move into a time of communion, and we're going to share this table, which everyone is welcome to, because it is for everyone. There are no restrictions to the table. I wanted to share a poem that showed up on my um, Facebook feed the other day, and I thought, okay, this is either the Holy Spirit or uh, an algorithm. So, whichever. Um, but uh, I'm going to go with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to make it a little bit more spiritual. Uh, but it's a poem by, an, um, by um, Naomi Shihab. Never heard of her. Uh, and, but it's titled Kindness. And it was read out uh, it, by Emma Thompson during COVID, during that very tough year of COVID when kindness was being tested in the world, when we were being asked to put the vulnerable first. Yeah, remember that time? Yeah, well, there was a lot of things that we had to put in place in order to protect the vulnerable. I wanted to begin communion by hearing that poem because that poem's message is that kindness isn't restricted by rules or differences. It goes beyond language and culture and situations, connecting people when they need help. And I, when I heard it, I thought, this is God. This is God. This is how God is. This is how God shows up in my life, how he can show up in your life, and how we're meant to be showing up for others. God is love, and love is kind. So as we take part in communion, let's remember that it's an invitation to experience the unrestricted kindness that Jesus offers to all of us. And my prayer is that our grief will always find God, God's kindness and through his kindness, our joy and hope will be restored again in Jesus. So James, please play the poem. And then after that, when you're ready, please come and take part on communion. Thank you. Hello, little lamb. It's big M here. Um, you've asked me to read the poem Kindness by Naomi Shihab Nye. And you asked me to dedicate it to someone or some people or a group. And I thought, gosh, there are so many choices. And then I thought I would dedicate it instead to our collective future, to the people that we are going to be after this. Because what the crisis has made so painfully clear is that we can't go back to normal. We have to replace some of our priorities with others. We have to place people before profit, place cooperation before competition, and above all, we have to access what has been so abundant, which is kindness. And we have to apply it to all our systems. And the first question that we need to ask ourselves when we address anything is, but is it kind? And I think this poem puts it better than anything I've ever seen before. Um, that's my stomach, by the way. Kindness. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go. So you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop, the passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, 
how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. When you're ready, when you are ready to receive kindness, please come and join us at this table. Please take a seat. As Jody said, I'm going to read John Donne's sonnet, Batter My Heart, Three Person God. And as I was preparing it, as I was um, reflecting on Maria's sermon, I think this is another lens um, through which we can understand Thomas, his trauma, his doubt. Uh, here's John Donne's lens, perhaps. Maybe it resonates with you too. <laughs> Batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine and seek to mend. That I might rise and stand, o'erthrow me and bend your force to break, blow, burn and make me new. I, like a usurped town to another Jew, labour to admit you but oh, to no end. Reason, your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captived and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie me or break that not again. Take me to you, imprison me, for I, except you enthrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste except you ravish me. Amen. 